announcements okay <laughs> I guess there are I will try I'm sure uh, Pastor Ron is uh, trying to slide his way this direction as well um, I actually <coughs> slid coming up in my road this morning it's relatively flat but uh, we're glad that you made it out I'm sure we have a lot of people watching us online today and uh, I mentioned up front that we will not be having any services tonight um, due to the plummeting temperatures and the ice that is going to be out. So stay home, stay safe. Also, tomorrow, um, everything is canceled here as well. Um, I think our academy and uh, preschool and everything is, and our upward uh, basketball will all be canceled tomorrow. So we would, uh, we would rather be safe. Now, the way we handle Sunday mornings, as many of you know, is we are on unless there is a, I guess, a, a, a state of emergency that is, that is pronounced. And, uh, but I always tell people, if it's bad out, I would rather see you next week than to come visit you in the hospital this coming week. And so we have to use good judgment. But we are thrilled that you were able to make it out uh, this morning. And um, our friend of the week this week is Pam Ward. So please uh, be in prayer for her if you know Pam and would like to contact her and you don't already have her contact information you can fo you can let uh, the office know here and we can get that to you um, also again there will be no services that means ETSs and everything uh, tonight none of those but Wednesday we will pick those up again and it's not too late to jump into the ETS classes if you're new and you say well what's an ETS that stands for equipping the saints it's based on Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12 and we are called to equip the saints for the work of the ministry and so these are individual classes about lots of different things and uh, we would encourage you to plug into those there are flyers available there in the welcome center if you'd like more information about it well let's stand together and hymn number 168 and I'm going to pray and we're going to sing father we thank you lord for this opportunity we have to come together and worship you and praise your name Lord, you are such a good God. And Lord, again today as we open the, the Bible and tell the story of Jesus, may we sing about it uh, to your glory and our good. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen.
doxology, please, as the ushers come forward. Good morning, church. Good morning. I'm uh, Jerry Mullins. Uh, currently serve on our deacon board here. And uh, I tell you today, we need to be trusting in the Lord with the weather, aren't, don't we? And that reminds me of uh, the 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 uh, message or the uh, in the Bible, uh, Proverbs three, five, and six. And it's one of my favorite. Uh, parts of the Bible. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Let us pray for our tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for this day and that we can come and worship you. And we know that everything we have belongs to you. And so we give back to you a portion that your word says that we need to do and we do it joyfully and so we ask that you bless the offering today and in all ways we acknowledge you as our lord and savior we ask <coughs> ask it all in jesus precious name amen Keep you. 
Let's stand together, greet those around you with a warm handshake. Would you pray with me? Father, Lord, as we open your word this morning, we acknowledge your holiness. We acknowledge that you are above us in all things. We acknowledge that you are the uncomprehendable God. Father, we thank you for those attributes, and Lord, we confess to you that we are not those things. We confess to you that we are men and women with feet of clay, sold under sin, purchased again through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we are so thankful that your grace has reached down to us. Father, we pray and ask that you would guide us as we open your word today um, in a very important topic and Father, that you would guide us in truth, that you would run ahead of us, that you would prepare our hearts for the seeds that you're about to plant with your word. And Lord, that you would watch over our church, guard us from the evil one. Help us, Lord, to glorify you and to stand before you one day saying, hearing you say, well done, good and faithful servants. So Lord, we commit this time to you and ask your blessing upon it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Now, this morning we're going to be talking this morning and next week about church leadership models, biblical church leadership models. And I'm sure if you looked at your, um, your bulletin there and saw the note insert, I'm sure that uh, most of you didn't get all excited about that topic this morning. Um, in fact, probably some of you are thinking right now, if I slip out, I can maybe go home and catch an early movie or something. Um, but a lot of times people do look at these subjects and say, you know, with all of the things that I have going on in my life right now, you're going to talk about church leadership for the next two weeks. 
uh, really, why are you going to do that? Or students many times look at something like this and they say, you know, what does this even have to do with my life? Well, I want to show you this morning and next week uh, that church leadership has everything to do with the things that are going on in your life right now and my life. Um, in fact, some of us who are here um, today, we have been greatly encouraged over the years in our faith walk from pastors and church leaders who encouraged us. And I can include myself in that group, but also there are those of us here who have been greatly hurt by pastors or church leaders as we've gone through in our faith walk. And I can certainly include myself at times in that group as well. And, and there are people that are not here today, uh, not just because of the weather, but because somewhere along the way they got hurt and they've been, they felt like they've been pushed out of the church. And so it is important, I believe, that we ask this question, what does God's word say about how church leadership needs to be set up? E.M. Bounds, a great uh, writer of, of, of theology, said that a church rarely revolts against or rises above the religion of its leaders. And that's true. And so it is critical that we find the biblical mandates for governance, polity, in the local church. And to that end, over the next two weeks, we're going to be talking about these two biblical offices in the New Testament church. Two offices given to the church by God. Now, let me say up front that if you are sitting there right now thinking the reason that you're doing this, Pastor, is because the Constitution Committee is preparing to roll out out in the next months the, the new constitution and that's why you're preaching on this well I would say to you that you are exactly right that's exactly why I'm doing it because we need to set this stuff up biblically now I also want to say to you and, and please don't miss this please don't miss this I'm going to share some scriptural models of leadership in the church that may be unfamiliar to you um, and 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 all I ask is that you hear the full counsel of God's word on this and that you prayerfully consider it before you jump to conclusions. That's all I ask. I was praying with the guys this morning in my office. They come and pray with me every Sunday morning before I come and preach. And I, I told them, I said, you know, I am a, I'm a man. I'm a man with flesh. I'm a man with feet of clay. I live in the community with the people to whom I preach. And so there's always that battle for a pastor because you understand traditions in churches. You understand what people are used to. And then you're confronted with God's word as a pastor. And there's that conflict that you have as a pastor because you're a person who wants, who, who you don't want to upset people. And you know when I preach these things that there are going to be some people that are going to say amen. There's going to be some people that are going to say oh me. And when you're a pastor and you hear your name, you learn to either duck or pucker, one or the other. And, and, and this is one of those times where there's, you're really conflicted. But you know what? At the end of the day, we as pastors, we will stand before God and give an account. And I think you guys know me well enough after two years, because I've kind of stiff-armed all this for two years, saying I, I need to let the people get to know me a little bit. And I pray that after two years, you know that I'm not going to present anything that is not supported by God's word. And so that is my prayer, that is my goal as we go forward in this, that you would understand that. Um, as we begin this process, let me ask you a question. And the question is this, if the Bible were clear that we should develop a church leadership model a certain way, should we obey it? I'm asking you. Yes, I think we would agree. Now, let me ask you this. What if that model was different from our personal experience or tradition? Should we obey our tradition or that biblical model if the Bible mandates it? The biblical model, right? I think we would all say that we need to obey the biblical model. And here's why I think that's an important question, because Jesus encountered some religious folks who were more concerned about keeping their traditions alive than obeying God's word. In Matthew 15, 6 through 9, listen to what he said to them. So for the sake of your tradition, 
You have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are is far from me, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So the process of allowing God's word to dictate our lives and our church and how we go forward is critically important. And also, many of you uh, received, I, I think many of you received, uh, the schedule of the proposed Constitution. Did any of you get that yesterday or some of you? Well, if you didn't, uh, those schedules are available in the Welcome Center. And please pick one up today before you leave or when you come back to the church. Again, if you're watching online, we're unable to get here, please pick one of those up. They'll be available online as well. You can pick them up here in the Welcome Center. But please pick those up because in that rollout schedule, we are asking all of our members to access, listen to these next two sermons, this one today and the one next Sunday, either in person, listen to it online, listen to it by request a CD. We'll get you a CD that you can listen to it. Ask for the transcript. We'll send you my notes, my transcript. Uh, Call the office, send us an email, send up smoke signals, whatever you have to do to to hear these two messages. We want to encourage you to do that. And also, along with these two sermons, we have scheduled like a month of information informational meetings in March so that you can submit and ask questions about the Constitution, things that you hear me preach on, things that you might have questions about, and you can ask and and you can avail yourself to all of those things before voting on the proposed uh, Constitution and bylaws, which will be made available in the next month in February. They'll be made available so you can have them and we'll pass them out to you and you can read them and go through the whole thing. And then, Lord willing, after these messages and after an entire month of informational meetings and answering questions, then on Sunday evening, March the 29th, uh, right now is the proposed date that we're going to be voting uh, on the proposed Constitution and bylaws. And by the way, this process has been going on for nearly six years. Uh, This process of the Constitution started before I had even heard about First Baptist Church of Hurricane. And so this doesn't have anything to do with me specifically or Pastor Lutz or Pastor Ron who was in the transition or you or the deacons or the Constitution Committee. This is all of us saying, what does God's Word say that we need to do? And let's go forward in that. So in in short, January this month, next two weeks, uh, check out these biblical teachings on the New Testament leadership model. In February, get your copy of the proposed Constitution and bylaws. And, and, and in light of Scripture, consider it and, and, and pray about it. And then in March, ask or submit your questions only after uh, listening to these two sermons. And then, um, you know, because, and the reason we're asking you to do that is because otherwise you end up asking questions that have already been answered two or three times through teaching and it's unfair to drag other people through that teaching again simply because you didn't take time to hear it. I say that in love and so that's why we're asking you to avail that and we will do all we can, whatever method you need, we will come over. I'll come over to your house and sit in your living room and re-preach the sermons to you again. How's that? How's that for accommodation? Now, none of you want that. So please pick up a copy of it. And then, Lord willing, Sunday evening, March the 31st, we will vote on it. And may God guide us to glorify him as we do. So let's dive into this this morning. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, where we see God define two primary groups of leadership in the church. Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, who is pastoring a church in Ephesus, and he says this, 1 Timothy, two, 1 Timothy 3, verse 1, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, there's the first one. We're going to talk more about that next week. He desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. What that means there is one scriptural wife at a time, no polygamy. We'll say more about that later. Sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and 
And here's an here's a important one, able to teach, okay? So the overseer has to be able to teach. You're not going to see that when we get down to the deacon. Not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for the church, for God's church? He must not be a re- recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. Verse 8. Deacons likewise. So here's the second office. This is going to be our focus today. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first and let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Now, we're going to stop here for just a moment and I'm going to pull off and, and, and talk about this for just just a moment and this is important so we're going to jump right into it because right here he links very clearly the qualifications for serving with both men and women not the qualifications of overseeing the qualifications of serving he links here to men and women all biblical scholars that I have read agree that the word used here for wives is also the word translated for women This translation then would permit the interpretation that women can be in this serving capacity. These are not my words. We are reading and studying God's word. And in fact, there was such a woman in the early church. For instance, in Romans chapter 16 and verse 1, there was a woman named Phoebe. And Phoebe is spoken of and the word used to describe her is diakonos. The same word here that we get the word deacon. So, we, you know, and by the way, we already have ladies in our church that are serving in these capacities and praise the Lord for them. And they're taking care of certain things. So what, I'm, what we really have to do when we approach God's word, we need to approach God's word and allow it to shape our thinking or reshape our thinking in many ways, to look at it biblically. I heard a pastor one time He said, when I approach a scripture, a passage of scripture, he said, I approach it as an agnostic, not in a spirit of, I don't believe what this says, but in a spirit of, I don't know what this means, and I'm not going to let all of my past influence, I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to me and show me what it truly means. And and let me tell you, I have been able to grow many times in that. And this isn't about, you guys know me. This is not about political correctness. You guys know I'm so far from that, that, that it's, 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 it's very plain. This is about God's word. This is about being faithful to it. And the prohibition of scripture that make many of you raise your eyebrow perhaps when I say that women can serve in this capacity is the prohibition of oversight that we'll get into more next week, not the prohibition of service. Never is that office. The, deacon, the office of deacon is supposed to be an office of service, not oversight. And deacons are not to provide the only oversight, only the service. So what are you saying, Pastor? Well, some say that this passage of Scripture is only referring to deacons' wives. Others say it provides for women to serve in a capacity, what the Bible would refer to as a deaconess. And the clue is the type of service that they're giving. In Romans 16, 2, where Paul's talking about Phoebe, here's what he says about her. He says, she has been a helper of many and myself also. So the passage of scripture that we're in this morning, 1 Timothy 3, is that these women must be reverent, they must be dignified, they must be sober, they must be, they must not be slanders, it says, look again, spending their time gossiping about other people, passing on, passing on false and hateful reports designed to hurt other people. If that's you, you don't need to be serving in this office. They must be temperate and self-controlled. We'll say more about that later. So please, as I asked before, please hang with me on this. I know I gave you a dose of medicine right there. 
Smile at me at least. Help me here a little bit. All right, thank you. Number 12, or verse 12, look what it says, continuing. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife. Again, one scriptural wife at a time, no polygamy. Managing their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. Now, I, I want to stop there for just a minute and make a point because he says in the household of God. These leadership systems that we are saying God established, he established for the church, inside the church. These are not outside the church. When we get into the oversight ministry next week and we start talking about that specifically and we see some prohibitions those prohibitions do not do not uh, hold water in a business outside of the church he's talking about the church he's not talking about outside the church so I just want to put that in your mind so you can hold on to that for next week he says which is the church of the living God a pillar and buttress of the truth great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness He, speaking of Christ, was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Now, notice that the church of the living God here in verse 15, as it says, is led by two specific groups in the church, overseers and deacons. Overseers and deacons. So what's the difference in the two? Well, here's, here's a way you can understand them. I, I wrote this down. The overseers are the servant leaders of the church, while the deacons are the leading servants of the church. All right? The overseers are the servant leaders of the church. They are overseeing the church. They're giving leadership, vision, those type of things. They're praying and and teaching. Remember I said the deacons weren't called to teach the word of God. They have to hold to the word of God, but they're never asked to teach it. The overseers are asked to teach it. And the deacons are the leading servants of the church. Now, let me clarify something else here, very important, that you need to understand. The Bible provides for only two offices in the church, overseers and deacons. With the overseers, there are several names in the New Testament given to describe the same office. Let me give you those. One name is shepherds. They're called shepherds. That has to do with the oversight ministry of their office. They're also called elders. That has to do with the dignity of their office. They're also called pastors. That has to do with the interrelational aspect of their office. And this will make more sense even next week again. They're called bishops. That has to do with the teaching aspect of their office. But every one of those four titles are referring to the same office of the overseer. All five terms refer to the same office. And we'll teach more on shepherds and overseers next week. But we're focusing today on the second group, the deacons, who are the leading servants in the church. Now, I want you to notice today three things about the deacons and what the deacons are called to do scripturally. Number one, if you're writing these in your notes, and I hope you are, so you can refer back to them, deacons meet needs. Deacons meet needs. According to God's word, the deacon meets needs in the church. That's the primary meaning of the very word diakonos. Uh, It's a spiritual service aimed at meeting specific needs in the church. Now, I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Turn there with me. And you say, why do you ask us to turn with you, pastor? It's on the board. It'll be on the screen. Why do you? Because I hope that you will find it in your copy of God's word. In case you have to go back and show somebody, you see it in God's word. And so I, I, I love to hear the pages turn when you do that. Now, we see here a picture that illustrates the title of deacon. And it's a great word. In the original language of the New Testament, the word has three different forms. Diakonos, diakonia, and diakoneo. And and all three forms here are the same word. The word is actually used a hundred times, in more than a hundred times in the New Testament, always referring to some area of serving. 
Acts chapter 6 uses the word to describe people who are leading the serving ministry in the church. And it's why we're using the term here that they are leading servants. Look at verse 1. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 and following. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And that they said please and that and what they said pleased the whole gathering and they chose Stephen a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas a proselyte of Antioch these they set before the apostles and prayed and laid hands on them And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now, you see the end of the verse there in verse number 2. Look again, the end of verse number 2, it says that they serve tables. That word there, serving, is one of the three forms of the word for deacon. It's diaconus. And, and, and if, you, if you look it up, I mean, look it up in your Bible concordances. If you have a Bible concordance, I encourage you to go to that passage of Scripture, Acts 6, verse 2. Look it up in your Bible concordance, and you're going to see the word is diakonos. It's going to tell you what it is. It, it means to serve, not to oversee. Deacons are called to serve, not to oversee. And I'm saying that in a lot of traditional Baptist churches that I've been involved with throughout my, throughout my ministry, we ask the deacons to do things that they're not called to do. Or our deacons feel the pressure to do that. And we exasperate the problem even more. I'll, I'll talk more about that in, in just a minute. I don't want to get ahead of myself here. But the picture of Acts 6 is basically two groups of leaders in the church. The first group is primarily responsible for oversight through prayer and the ministry of the word. And they were shepherding the flock. We are referring to them here as a council of shepherds. A council of shepherds. There was always more than one. There wasn't just a senior pastor. There was always a leader among equals in the New Testament church. But there was always a multiplicity of these overseers. And we'll talk more about that. Are you getting tired of me saying we'll talk more about that? But, but I, I see, you see my struggle? I'm struggling up here before you because I already see the whole picture. I already see what I'm going to be teaching next week. And I want you to have already seen it. And you can't already see it because we're not there yet. So, I, so forgive me. And then you have this other group that has been raised up in the church, and they're called deacons, and they have a serving ministry. So the question is, what do deacons do? If they don't provide oversight, what do they do? Well, the needs here in Acts 6 arose from specific circumstances in the early church in Jerusalem. Specific circumstances. The church was growing. And and one of the specific needs mentioned here is they were trying to distribute food to widows and they couldn't get it done. And so here were these overseers and they couldn't do the oversight ministry because they were having to distribute the food to the widows. And there was this, there was this division that was created in the church. Now, now let me say here, I believe this is one of the reasons why we don't see clearly every detail responsibility of the deacons spelled out in the New Testament because the needs of every church is different from church to church. And they're going to be different today. They're going to be different. Another need's going to come tomorrow. In this region, it's going to be a different. We battle some things here in, in Hurricane and our surrounding area that we never battled when I was pastoring in Kentucky or Ohio or North Carolina or South Carolina. There are many things that are similar, but there are some things that are unique to our ministry. And so I believe that's why this isn't spelled out. And I mean, just think here about how God and his word necessitates 
just that one ministry that I believe is very consistent from church to church, the ministry to our widows and to our widowers. That's, that's a responsibility here that's clearly given to deacons. And in fact, uh, last year, I, I brought this large map to one of our, our deacons meetings. You guys remember that? I brought this large map and, and, I, and I had blue marks and red marks and black marks on it. And, and I said to the guys, I said, hey, these, these, these red marks are where all of our widows live. And it showed marks all over the map. And I said, these blue marks are where all of our widowers live. And I said, those black marks are where you guys live. And, and we have to take care of all of these people. And let me tell you, that's already been, taking, been done. And there are a lot of, of deacons that were taking on a lot of responsibility with this. And, and many of the deacons said, hey, it's so hard for us to do these service type ministries because we have to take oversight in so many things. And they were saying, this is, this is difficult because of that. And so we were all praising the Lord together that the, that the constitution that we are going to be proposing is going to write this to the point where they can focus on those ministries. And let me say, that man, our deacons have taken that map and, and Carl has given leadership to that and, and they're, they've taken their biblical challenge in scripture uh, and, and they're forming a detailed ministry to our widows and to our widowers and, and praise the Lord for those who serve this church in that capacity, in that office of a deacon. And I praise the Lord. I've been so blessed as a pastor throughout the years. I, I've heard so many pastors refer to their deacons as demons. Seriously, I've never experienced that in all of my years of ministry. I have always been blessed to have godly men who have been there serving alongside in that capacity. But um, we have to look at this in light of Scripture. And by the way, I must say in, in that in my 30 plus years of vocational ministry, this proposed constitution that will be before us and these bylaws and our articles of faith are the strongest biblically that I have seen in ministry. And you know how I can tell? Because when I hold them up beside God's word, they match. And so I praise the Lord for that and I praise the Lord for those who are serving right now. You see, here's the problem in so many churches. We ask the deacons to perform the role of overseers and deacons God never intended to serve in that way. And to exasperate it even further, we ask the senior pastor to assume the oversight ministry all by himself, either burning out pastor after pastor or creating dictatorial ships that was never meant to be in the church. And we end up wearing everyone out. As we're going to see next week, there were always a, multiple, a multiplicity of shepherds in the church. There was always a leader. I believe there was a senior pastor, a leader among equals in that group. And worse yet, we try to, to develop some kind of a politically correct business model and we wrongly conclude that God is going to bless that mess. I have a, a friend that's fond of saying, God don't bless mess. And he doesn't. You know, Pastor Brian, our student pastor, and I were, were talking about some churches uh, recently who have tried to implement sort of an executive business board model to run their church. And, and, and every one of those churches you look at, they're floundering. Because we must be biblical. God has created order in the church and we must follow that. So number one, deacons meet needs. Number two, deacons support the ministry of the word. You know, not only in, in Acts chapter 6 here do they meet the needs, they were supporting the ministry of the word. Because here these widows were and they weren't getting served and the overseers were having to go take care of that ministry. It's sort of like our deacons saying it's so hard to do these serving ministries when we've got all this oversight stuff to do as well. You see, deacons are not a board of directors. Listen, when God's word, the problem here with the early church is the word of God wasn't going out. 
The word of God and the oversight wasn't happening because of all of this other stuff that was going on. All of these other things that, that, that these overseers were having to deal with. And listen, when God's word ceases to go out with power and accuracy, the church always suffers. That's a good place to amen right there. As a result, the mission of the church will always suffer in these, in these cases. Listen, when God's word doesn't go out, it, it's, it's a problem. And that's why boards and committees and ministries and teams are critical in the local church. Everybody working together. <clears throat> My son had a high school basketball coach that would always break their huddle. You know how when teams have a timeout and then they get ready before they go out and they all go break and they usually say something like team or, or whatever. Well, when they would break their huddle, they would break their huddle with the word trust. They go trust. And I asked him one day, I said, why that word? Why trust? You know, uh, and he said to me, he said, he explained to me that everyone on the team had to be confident that everybody else on the team was going to rotate to where they needed to be so that everybody else could be responsible for what they were called to do. He said, otherwise, people are out of place, people are out of position, and the, 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 the opponent goes right through us. And I thought about that, and I thought, boy, that's just like the church. Because I know so many senior pastors and deacon boards who have tried to be lone rangers and we fail ourselves and we fail the people that God has called us to lead. You know, one of the most important statements I believe that you will read in our proposed constitution and bylaws, uh, the, the first one I believe is that the, uh, I'm a congregationalist. I believe that the final court of appeals and that the authority of a local church belongs in its membership. I believe I'm a congregationalist in that way. But, and so uh, one of the statements in our constitution says that the, uh, the authority of the congregation um, uh, is superior to the authority of all the boards, the council of shepherds, the deacons, the committees, everybody, the membership has that authority. And praise the Lord, I think that's a healthy biblical model. But the other statement that I think is so important that you're going to read in there says the shepherds um, of the church, the council of shepherds, do not do the work of the boards and committees. Praise God. It's everybody trusting that everybody else is doing what they're supposed to do. The, over, the, the, the council of shepherds overseeing the church and the ministries fitting together. The, the board of deacons serving in that capacity that God has called them to serve in. So, so we see clearly how important both issues are to God. God wants the church to be fully devoted to his word. And he wants the church to be fully devoted to taking care of the needs of the people that he connects to the church. So the church needs leaders who are devoted to both, uh, to both of these things. And this is a, a critical role that the deacons play in the church. Deacons serve the council of shepherds so the council of shepherds can oversee the church. And these deacons here, Stephen, if you look, some of the names there, Stephen and others freed the apostles to devote themselves to prayer and the application of the word of God. And this is huge. Because the deacons are not some second power group in the church. This is not a power board that's competing with the shepherds. No. The Acts 6 deacons are helping to make sure that the shepherds and pastors are leading as God designed for them to lead. Now, I want you to note here also that only seven deacons were selected here. And that's certainly not large enough to handle the entire problems and needs that were facing the church. And there were, th there were thousands of people serving in the church. So these, these deacons were organizing others to make the work go forward and make sure the work got done. And again, everybody in the church was intended to serve. The, 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 these people were helping to lead all the others. That's why we call them the leading servants. 
So number one, deacons must, deacons meet needs. Number two, deacons support the ministry of the word. And finally, deacons unify the church around the word of God. Look at Acts 6 again. Um, Christians were being, uh, beginning to complain here against each other. There was disunity breaking out in the church. And so the deacons step in with their ministry and they, they quench off this disunity in the church. And this is where we square really the picture of Acts 6 with the all, what we already read with the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 with regards to the deacons and their call and sort of their character. Here it is, a beloved picture of that deacons demonstrate Christ-like character with a servant's heart. Deacons demonstrate Christ-like character with a servant's heart. The church in Acts 6 was growing so fast. And the church needed leaders who could call everybody back to the mission of the church. And that would promote the unity of the church. Listen, deacons are not small-minded people engrossed in some power struggle, only caring about their own agendas and only lobbying about the ministries that are important to them. No. They are honorable, genuine, self-controlled, sacrificial givers. Look Look at the list again. Who are devoted to God's word. They're not having to teach it, although deacons don't have to have the gift of teaching that the shepherds do. The deacon must be faithful, blameless, both personally and with their family. You know, perhaps the most noticeable distinction here between shepherds and deacons, if you look again in our, back in our passage in 1 Timothy, is that deacons do not need to be able to teach. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. They are, they are called to hold to the faith, it says, with a clear conscience. But they are not called to teach that faith. 1 Timothy 3, 9. Now that's an important point here. I mean, this means that deacons do not have to have the doctrinal role of oversight in the church that the shepherds have to have. You say, why is that important? Because according to that pattern established in Acts 6 with the apostles, the office of deacon is service-oriented. Deacons are servants who do whatever is needed to allow the shepherds, the overseers to accomplish their God-given direction in leading the church. So since the role of deacon, listen to this, since the role of deacon is a service-focused ministry and not an oversight-focused ministry, I believe Scripture allows for women to serve in that, leader, or in that service capacity in the church. And we referred to Phoebe a minute ago, the deaconess. Now you say, well, I need some more verses for that. Well, let's, let's look at some more verses. 1 Timothy 3.11 But first, remember our initial question to this. Our initial question was, if the Bible is clear that we should develop a church structure in a certain way, should we obey it? And we all said, what? Yes. And we said, what if it doesn't line with our personal experience or our tradition? What should we do? And we said, we we should follow God's word. So after discussing the qualifications of a deacon, notice it says there, we're back in 1 Timothy 3.11, 1 Timothy 3.11, After discussing the qualifications of a deacon, it says, it uses the word likewise, also their wives. Now again, the word wives is also translated women, and we'll say more about that. Must be dignified, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in every aspect. So Paul is not exclusively here talking about specifically just the wives of the deacons. Instead, he's referring to any woman who is led in this servant-focused ministry of the church. You say, how so? Well, let me give you four proofs. Proof number one. Paul's use here of the word likewise, likewise is a conjunctive adverb. A conjunctive adverb, as many of you English folks know, they connect two thoughts together. And so he's using this conjunctive adverb in means to join two things together because there are no qualifications given for for wives of the shepherds when qualifying them. If, if it was important to give qualifications for, um, for the deacon's wives and not the shepherd's wives, why is that? Well, because the, because the wives or the women he's referring to here with the deacons 
is a service-oriented position. uh, Wives were not or women were not called to be the elders or overseers or pastors of the church. And we'll talk again more about that next week. Number two, women can serve as a deaconess because there are, not, there are no possessive pronouns connecting the women to the deacons in 1 Timothy 3.11. In versions that translate it, their wives, the word there is supplied by the translator. It's not in the majority text. A third reason women can serve as deaconesses when you have the polity right and you have a, if you have a council of shepherds. Uh, women can serve as deaconesses because in Romans 12.1, Paul talks about the deaconess named Phoebe, a woman who serves as a deaconess and is called a diakonos. Number four, since the role of deacon does not provide for the oversight of the church, it does not violate Paul's instructions about women not serving as shepherds in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, which we will what? Say more about that next week. You guys are getting it finally. Um, so, so I believe, I, I truly believe that scripture is referring here to ladies who were serving in this capacity. And I believe scripture bears out that deacons, both the men and the women serving the church in this official servants of the church as a ministry uh, in a growing church, that they are recognized in scripture to support the ministry of the oversight of the shepherds to the congregation. They are the leading servants in the church. You know, again, this is God's word that drives us. It's not our traditions. It's not even our personal preferences. One of the main things I hope is clear in this whole series is that God defines and designs the church and when, when he does, we have to live and operate according to his design, not our preferences. And our goal is to align as much as possible with the Bible and what it says. Here's a good gauge for you. I wrote down this. Where God's word speaks, have conviction. Where God's word is silent, have grace. But in all things, have love. Can we say that together? I think that's important. Where God's word speaks, have conviction. Where God's word is silent, have grace. But in all things, have love. You know, I want to close this out by going back to Acts chapter 6 and verse 7 to show you one final result. The first six verses here show the body of deacons and the council of shepherds working together in the church as God designed it. And then notice... God gives us the result of that obedience in verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. What a great verse. First Baptist Church of Hurricane. I believe that's what we want to say as well. Amen. Let it be said of us that our church, that we followed God's word so closely that God blessed it. May we hear him say to us one day, well done, good and faithful servants. So don't miss the connection here. If we want that, it will only happen as we become more and more and more in line with how God has marked the biblical leadership of the church to be designed. Remember the quote from E.M. Bounds, a church rarely revolts against or rises above the religion of its leaders. We want to do these things in a way that honors God and helps build up his church as he designed it. This journey of the Constitution and bylaws of First Baptist Church, as I said, started well before I ever heard of Hurricane First Baptist Church. So this is not about Dr. Lutz. This is not about the committee. It's not about Ron Stoner, who was the interim and did a great job keeping this church moving forward. It's not about the deacons. It's not about this constitution committee. It's not about me. It's not about any of us. 
or even who is going to come after us. We must all follow God's word. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word that we have a a guidebook to show us how we should go forward, that we don't have to stick our fingers in the wind and take a poll about what we should do. We don't have to be concerned about being politically correct. Father, we understand that the very name of Christ is very offensive. And so, Father, help us to have balance in this. Lord, guard our hearts in this. For, Lord, one day we cannot barrel forward in this and, and promote things above your word. We have to follow you, God, because one day we will all stand before you and give an account for how we responded to your word. I will give an account, Lord, as I stand before you of how I have taught this today. And so, Father, may you be glorified, you alone. And may you have your hand upon our church. And may you guard us and guide us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, let's stand together. We're going to close in prayer. Um, I'm going to be out by the Welcome Center. I know we're down a little bit in numbers because of the weather. But if I would love to meet you if you're visiting. And I haven't met you yet. I'll be out there. And uh, Pastor Ron will be coming and closing us in, um, in prayer in just a moment after we sing. If you have any questions about uh, salvation, church membership, baptism, anything like that, uh, Pastor Ron will be up here. You can come talk to him. Come talk to me out there. And we'd love to answer those questions. Thank you for braving the weather and being out here today with us to worship. of our pastor. We need the leadership of your Holy Spirit through him and to us. We need to be sensitive as you guide, and we pray that you will bring this church to the strongest, healthiest constitution, bylaws, articles of faith that can lay a foundation for future that will end, as the word said, with many coming to Christ and growing in Christ and impacting the world to the glory of our living God. Guide us now, we pray through Jesus.